Yes, sir. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, I hope my slide is visible to you and I'm audible. Uh, now, one of the biggest hindrance for any person who wants to start PCNL is the fear of bleeding. This fear is really not unjustified because we know that nearly 20% of our cardiac value, cardiac output goes through kidney every minute. Before I start, I would want to give my reverence to my professor, Dr. Percy Chibber. Let me start by sharing one very interesting story with you. This was one of my initial days when I was doing PCNL for a smooth round stone in a lower calyx. Those days we used to use ultrasound lithotripsy and as luck should have it, though I had made a very good track. When I tried to puncture this, uh, when I was trying to break the stone by lithotripsy, the ultrasound burr slipped out of the stone, over the stone, and it went into the pelvic system like a dagger. When I pulled out this uh, ultrasound probe, the blood that came out through the implant sheath was, the stream was as big as the size of the implant sheath, which was nearly 30 French. I asked my assistant to plug the implant sheath with his thumb, remove my glove, called up my professor, what to do next? He said, okay, don't panic. Try and get inside the renal pelvis. If possible, place an nephrostomy tube there or place an nephrostomy tube wherever you are and clamp the tube. He gave the necessary instructions. Next three days before I could see the patient, he would call up, ask about how the patient is. And the third day, he gave a very, very interesting instruction. He said, Pankaj, remove the nephrostomy tube at 3 p.m. Now, as a student, I again asked him, why 3 p.m.? Usually, we would want to do such procedures very early in the day. And then he said, okay, I have booked the angiography suit at 5 p.m. If there is a bleeding, we would need two hours to shift the patient there. Friends, luckily, nothing happened to this patient. Uh, what this showed to me was that most serious bleeding tend to uh, get controlled on its own. So there is really nothing to worry or panic. And in event of crisis, you need some senior person whom you can talk to and who can guide you how to proceed further. My further thanks goes to a lot of people whom may, I may not have worked directly with them, but I have seen them in multiple conferences. And when you see such big wigs doing PCNLs in conferences, there is suddenly a aha moment where you realize, yes, this is one tip I can adopt in my practice and gradually your PCNL improves. Bleeding is possible whenever a kidney is punctured. There was a study where CT scan was done immediately after PCNL and they found hematomas in nearly 100% patients, though these were not clinically significant. Significant bleeding is possible in around half a percent of PCNs and around 5% of PCNL. The risk of bleeding is higher in PCNL because you make a larger tract and you do manipulations inside the kidney. This is one slide which most of us have seen. The blood vessels enter the kidney at the renal hilum and the renal artery keep on, keep, keeps on bifurcating at its, as it moves peripherally, radially towards the periphery of the kidney. When we see at the blood vessel, this is how the blood vessels are oriented in the, in the kidney. So if I make art my tracks, which are parallel to these blood vessels, the risk of injuring these major blood vessels will be very less. In contrast, if I make a puncture, which is across these blood vessels, there is a possibility that I would puncture these major arteries and land into significant bleeding. We also know that we should try and puncture the uh, pelvic glacial system through the papilla. This is the least vascular area of the kidney. When I enter from here, my further entry into pelvic glacial system is easy. I do not do any significant torque. In contrast, if I do an infundibular puncture, I risk injury to interlobar arteries. If I overshoot, I can even traumatize the segmental artery. Further from here, when I try to enter the pelvic glacial system, I need to bend my scope and implant sheath and hence stop the system the kidney and probably risk increased bleeding. Are there any factors which can predict which patients would bleed more? One of the important factors is how much experience you have and how much time you take to uh, do this procedure. If you are doing a complex procedure, better to take help. Uh, literature has shown that adequate uh, experience is gained by around 20 cases, a reasonable experience is gained by around 40 cases, and for mastery, you need minimum 100 cases. So in your initial cases, go slow, choose your cases well, and you would uh, reduce the risk of bleeding. 
again when i choose the patient in my initial cases i would not choose a patient which is who has a compact system compact system or absence of hydronephrosis would mean that the cortical thickness is more and when i puncture through this uh, thick cortex the risk of bleeding increases infection is one very important cause for bleeding adequately diagnosing infection and treating infection pre op is extremely important infected kidneys are more friable more vascular and hence have an increased risk of bleeding obese patients with diabetes hypertension may have associated ath uh, atherosclerosis and when i puncture these atherosclerotic vessels these vessels may not collapse and hence the bleeding may be more salutary kidney should be taken with a sense of uh, uh, say uh, caution because i do not want to land into a system a situation where i create bleeding in the salutary kidney does previous history of surgery increase the risk of bleeding this is debatable probably it should not the only way this can be explained is that if there is a previous pyelolithotomy done the kidney would be fixed and hence whatever movement i try to do in the kidney i could torque the system and hence increase the risk of bleeding a complex stone definitely increases the risk of uh, bleeding uh, whenever there is a complex stone you need to plan your punctures well there was a time when i used to make one puncture at a time and then i realized that when i make one puncture dilate the tract and try to make the second puncture i can't instill contrast in the system because now if i instill contrast that contrast can extravasate and i can land into a system like this where i now do not know where the pelvic collision system is and how to puncture the system further so if you have a system like this where you feel you would need more than one puncture like in this patient the minimum tracts i would expect is 3 probably 4 in this patient i would pre place all the guide wires when i pre place guide wires before dilating any tract the guide wires are placed in a kidney which is not been traumatized by dilatation there is no perinephric bleeding or urinoma collection so the anatomy is well maintained i can fill the system well with contrast so i know exactly where i am uh, puncturing further i dilate the tract which gives me access to the maximum stone burden uh, if needed other tracts are dilated if not needed the wires can be just pulled out without causing any harm to the patient if patient is on antiplatelet agents please avoid doing pcnl though by literature pcnl can be done in low dose aspirin by mistake by uh, oversight i have done pcnl in few patients who were on low dose aspirin patients went well but as far as possible try and avoid this situation how do you dilate also decides how much bleeding happens uh, balloon dilatation will have the least chance of bleeding amplas dilators because intermittently the tract will not have tamponade the risk of bleeding will be more elkins dilators though they are telescopic and the tamponade is maintained but these being metallic dilators carry the risk of injury to the parenchyma and hence the bleeding again there is a lot of discussion about a single step dilatation versus gradual dilatation though theoretically uh, a single step dilatation should cause more trauma but literature says that the risk of bleeding is same in both the situations we have already seen that as far as possible i should make a papillary puncture and not a infundibular entry infundibular entry would bleed more now whether i go in anterior and posterior calyx also makes a difference if i enter through the posterior calyx i have a straight access to the renal pelvis and hence i do not do any torque and the risk of bleeding will be less but if i go in the anterior calyx i would need to dip down to enter the renal pelvis and create a torque this is shown by a very interesting observation that i have had we all know how to identify the posterior calyx but intraoperatively one very interesting finding that i have realized is that when you put in a wire and if the wire goes smoothly down the ureter or wire goes smoothly and coils in the upper calyx most likely this is the posterior calyx if you enter the anterior calyx then because the directions are not right the wire will tend to coil in the calyx so if the wire doesn't go in smoothly definitely your scope would need a lot of manipulation to enter in and this manipulation could increase the risk of bleeding there is again a discussion whether upper calyx puncture bleeds more a lot of literature has said that puncturing upper calyx the theoretical risk of bleeding is high i would like to say here that upper calyx puncture is one of my preferred mode of puncture because i feel it gives a brilliant access 
to renal pelvis, all components of lower calyx, and even the upper ureter. And I have not found the bleeding to be higher. One reason I feel upper calyx uh, is likely to bleed more is say, this is the patient with the 11th and 12th rib mark. So if I try to enter this calyx, then I would need to make a supra 11th puncture. And this will give me a direct access to this calyx. In an attempt to avoid uh, supracostal access, if I go subcostally to this calyx, I would be going through a significant amount of parenchyma. I would be going across a lot of blood vessels. And hence, the bleeding and torque is likely to be more. So a fear of pleural violation would increase the chance of bleeding if you go through the upper calyx. Friends, if there is a stone which deserves upper calyx puncture, don't be afraid of supracostal excess. There is no risk of injuring to the lung. At best, you would have some pleural fluid collection, which can be managed very, very easily. I am absolutely against making white tracts. Now, if you look at this skin puncture, this skin puncture is ideally suited for the middle calyx. Now, with this skin puncture, if I try to puncture the upper and lower calyx, again, the needle orientation in my pelvic collection system is not good. And as I have been saying, I would go through a lot of parenchyma and across a lot of blood vessels, so would cause a lot of trauma. Making one more sc small puncture in the back is of no risk. So instead of calling it white rack, I always say, why make white rack? The size of your sheath and the uh, size of your nephrostomy has also been studied in depth. We know that the smaller the, the track we make, the risk of bleeding will be less. We were one of the first to show that nephrostomy plays hardly any role in reducing bleeding post-op. We had shown that even if you put a small bore pigtail catheter instead of a large bore catheter, the bleeding does not increase. Rather, patient has a smooth post-operative course. It is shown without uh, uh, any doubt that the size of nephrostomy would not, uh, 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 say, dictate the amount of bleeding that the patient has. And if your push, procedure goes smooth, there is absolutely no harm in doing a tubeless PCNL. Bleeding can happen in any step of PCNL uh, when you in initially in insert needle or dilate or during the procedure. Venous bleedings are usually very uh, low in amount and can be managed by clamping of the nephrostomy tubes. Arterial bleedings are more brisk and usually would need some form of intervention. So if I put my initial puncture needle and if instead of urine, frank blood comes in, that means my needle tip is inside a blood vessel, I should not be accepting this needle tip, repuncture and again go in a proper calyx. Only when you get a good efflux of urine, only then dilate. If you under or over dilate, you definitely lead to bleeding. Under dilatation, it is possible that the tract continues to bleed. Uh, we also need to remember that the tip of the empla sheath is a bevel tip. Say if I go in and I'm partly out and I see that there is a bleeding coming from three o'clock position and the longer end of my empla sheath is towards nine o'clock, all I need to do is rotate my empla sheath a bit so that the longer end blocks the bleeding at three o'clock and I can continue with the procedure. If I have made a through and through puncture and if the bleeding is coming from my opposite wall, not much can be done. In this situation, probably it will be better to stage, put in a nephrostomy tube stage, let uh, the bleeding cool off and come again later. You need to make a tract which is appropriate tract size, which is appropriate to the size of the infundibulum. Now, this is the most important instruction if I want to avoid bleeding from the infundibulum. If I try to put in a large size empla sheath through a narrow infundibulum, there could be diffuse bleeding through the infundibulum which would be very difficult to manage. Now, bleeding can also happen once I finish the procedure. So my full procedure has gone smooth, but when I was trying to remove the empla sheath, I suddenly see that there is brisk bleeding from the tract. This suggests that the bleeding is from the interparenchymal vessels or from the parietes. The best thing to do is you can give a compression. A compression can be given by a dressing or by keeping two fists above and below and holding the lower pole of the kidney between two fists. You could use a tamponade catheter. Here, uh, a case balloon catheter can be used, though I would say that I have never seen a case balloon catheter. I've only seen the pictures of this balloon catheter. What I've been using is to use a 20 French Foley catheter, cut off the tip of the catheter beyond the balloon, and then inflate the balloon at the site where the bleeding is. 
give a light traction there, inflate the balloon by 5 cc and reduce the balloon capacity by 2.5 cc every day. Some uh, uh, modern building can get controlled by placing such polycatheter. If there is a brisk bleeding coming, which is uh, coming in spurts and looks to be arterial bleeding, you can go in and fulgurate this bleeding. Over my nearly 25 years of PCNL, there have been around two to three occasions by I, when I saw an arterial bleeder, which could be fulgurated. So keep this in mind, whenever needed, this can be done. Hemostatic agents have been described, which are instilled in the tract so that the tract doesn't bleed. Though these cannot be used once the bleeding starts, these used to be, this at best would reduce the chance of bleeding and reduce the chance of post nephrostomy tube removal leakage. Now your procedure has gone good, but once you, uh, 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 in the patient is in the uh, ward, then you see that there is a bleeding. Uh, you need to decide the treatment based on whether the nephrostomy tube is in place or not. Before removal of nephrostomy tube, always see the skin around the nephrostomy tube and the dressing of the nephrostomy tube. If the skin around the nephrostomy tube is red or if the dressing is showing bright blood, this is a patient where you will suspect that there may be some bleeding at the time of nephrostomy tube and you would take precautions before removal of this nephrostomy tube. Very rarely patient can present to you with delayed bleeding. That means you have discharged the patient and patient comes back with brisk bleeding. This would happen in around 1% patients. Whenever this happens, suspect that there is some vascular lesion, either a pseudoaneurysm, AV fistula, or an artery which has opened in a calyx. Uh, most patients relate this to sudden exertion and movement. The cause of this is that maybe that uh, artery is partially blocked by a clot. And when the patient, patient suddenly strains, the clot gets dislodged and this patient comes to you with bleeding. Such bleedings are usually very significant and you need to hospitalize this patient for further treatment. The management of bleeding, the aim initially is conservative, give the patient hemodynamic support, cover the patient well with antibiotics, especially if preoperatively or intraoperatively you thought that there was some infection, then proper antibiotic cover is very important, evaluate the patient. So a color doctor examination or a CT angiography would be very important and right. keep ready everything like blood transfusion and selective artery embolization. Manage the patient well, look at the vitals, keep the nephrostomy tube clamped, keep the external drainage, give blood transfusion, resuscitate, always catheterize the patient so that you know the severity of bleeding, hydrate the patient well, and uh, once you have done that, decide which patient would need angiography. This would be needed, obviously, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable or if he's getting repeated clot, needing repeated clot evacuations. Remember, from kidney bleeding to form clots in bladder, this would mean that the bleeding is extremely brisk and hence this is a sign that probably uh, angiographic intervention is warranted. Again, if patient needs multiple transfusions or if you obviously see some lesion on Doppler, you would go in and do an angiography. This is one very interesting study from Guwahati where they tried to, where they did angiography directly the moment patient presented with secondary bleeding. And they thought that only 5% of these patients have negative angiography. Most patients have some lesion. So they proposed that probably conservative treatment may not help and early or aggressive angiography should be done. In angiography, you could find most commonly pseudoaneurysm or AV fistula. In some patients, there will be multiple uh, angiographic findings. AV fistula happens when both artery and vein get injured together and the arterial high pressure blood tries to get into the vein because of the high pressure, the vein cannot sustain this pressure and the vein ruptures. If the vein ruptures in the pelvic collateral system, patient will present with bleeding. If the vein ruptures, uh, uh, say perirenal, then patient with, will present with weak abdominal pain and falling hematocrit. Uh, the bleeding in these situations is usually continuous. In contrast, the bleeding from pseudoaneurysm is intermittent because intermittently the senior aneurysm gets clot, clotted off and intermittently it re ruptures. Now, pseudoaneurysm forms when the high pressure artery uh, leaks inside a low resistance connective tissue. And then uh, uh, this, uh, in contrast, uh, in uh, uh, sequence leaks in the pelvic collateral system. Many agents have been used. You would ideally leave it to your uh, interventional radiologist. Post embolization, keep the patient hospitalized, hydrate him well, continue the bladder irrigation. Because even after you angioembolize, some bleeding will keep on trickling, which has been there in the pericalation system. And you do not want 
those small clots to come in the bladder and block your catheter. Antibiotic coverage is important because some amount of renal ischemia and necrosis always happens. If bleeding continues, you will need to consider repeat angiography or surgical intervention. Common complications, the most common complication is post-embolization syndrome where patient presents with uh, vomiting, vague abdominal discomfort, vague feeling of ill health. This probably happens in every patient. Re luckily, renal artery dissection, non-target embolization and loss of renal function is very rare. Coil migration has been reported. There are reports of stones formation uh, on coils that have migrated in the pelvic system. Contrast nephropathy is possible because a large amount of contrast is instilled during the procedure. Angiogram embolization can fail when you have made multiple access. So maybe you have coagulated one side, but the other side opens up later on. And when you do not use a proper uh, embolization thing. If angioembolization is unavailable, you need to do an open surgery. Remember, during open surgery, you need to follow all principles of management of renal trauma. Proper control of renal vessels is very, very important. Only then you will be able to repair kidney and salvage renal function. This is a demanding procedure, and it is important that you take help during this procedure. A few very interesting alternatives have been described to angioembolization. One is a covered stent, which only blocks the fistula but the uh, arterial continuity is maintained. So there will be preservation of renal parenchymal function or you can ultrasonographically inject uh, thrombin and fibrin in a pseudoaneurysm and block this pseudoaneurysm. This is where it is shown. This is a pseudoaneurysm which has been blocked. And in the later angiography image, the pseudoaneurysm is no longer seen. The bleeding post PCNL is not always through the kidney. This is a patient where bleeding happened through a major subcostal artery. This patient needed uh, angiography at least three times before they diagnosed the bleeding from the subcostal artery. And then once it was diagnosed, embolizing that was very, very easy. This usually will present with bleeding through the tract or bleeding from the side of the nephrostomy tube. We have reported two patients where there was bleeding through the lumbar artery. Again, diagnosing this would need a very good uh, interventional radiologist who would look at all sources of bleeding before he says no source found. To conclude, it is very, very important to understand and visualize the anatomy well. PCNL is a game of visualization. We need to understand the 3D anatomy because what you see on fluoroscopy is a two-dimensional image. And based on the two-dimensional image, you need to work in a three-dimensional field. Have a good respect to kidney. Do not be very aggressive. Do whatever you are capable of doing. Don't try to pick up a non-dilated stegon in your initial cases and whenever in doubt stage. You can always come again later on to fight better. If you survive, you can always fight later. Thanks for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Maheshwari. It was a, uh, am I audible to you? Yes, sir. Okay. It was a very comprehensive talk, a beautiful talk on the very extensive topic. I have already started receiving many questions because bleeding is the main problem. Everyone is scared of and everybody wants an answer to how to do a bloodless PCNL. So anyway, be there. <laughs> we will be requesting I'm, I'm you this. to be there, yeah, please.